there's a passage for that. Buddha's visited by Ananda. Ananda says, you know, it's half the holy life, having admirable friendship, having admirable friends. And the Buddha says, no, don't say that. It's not half the holy life, it's the whole of the holy life. After all, if it weren't for the Buddha, we wouldn't know the path. We're dependent on him. This is what it means to take refuge, to point out to us what's really worthwhile in life, what's a wise course of action in life, without his having discovered the path. We probably wouldn't be here right now. We'd be off someplace else, doing who knows what. But here we are focusing on the breath. Again, if there had been nobody to tell us that this would be a good thing to do, we might not even think of doing it. But it is a good thing to do, because we develop good qualities in the mind. And by developing good qualities in the mind, we tackle the big problem in life, which is suffering. The Pali word dukkha has a wide range of meanings, everything from really intense suffering down to very subtle levels of stress. And it's a problem because as long as we're driven by our fear of dukkha, fear of suffering and stress, we're going to do a lot of unskillful things. We're going to harm ourselves, we're going to harm other people. But when we can solve this problem, then we're not driven. We're not driven by fear, we're not driven by favoritism, anger, delusion, the things that make people do a lot of unfair and very unskillful things. That's our contribution not only to our own happiness, but also to the well-being of those around us. Because there's no way you can make the world perfect. People resist other people's ideas of what perfection might be, and often with good reason. So instead of trying to straighten out the world, you straighten out what's going on in your own mind. And if everyone does that, the world will be a, a very peaceful place. But even if they don't do it, the fact that you are straightening out your mind means that you're dealing with the problem at the source. And you're the res person responsible for dealing with it. as the Buddha analyzed the problem of suffering. It's basically the fact that we don't know how to use our powers of judgment. The things we cling to, the things we crave, are precisely the things that cause suffering and constitute suffering. This is why he told Rahula when he was going to teach him meditation, as the very first step, make your mind like earth. People can pour perfume on the earth. The earth doesn't come rising up to receive the perfume. They can pour garbage on the earth, and the earth doesn't get disgusted. You try to develop that quality of being non-reactive, not passing judgment, just noticing these things have happened, and not allowing yourself to get upset. Now this is not the goal of the path. In fact, it's a preliminary to meditation. Develop that sort of solidity so that you can become a good observer of your own mind. It's not that you're going to stop passing judgment on things, but just you rest for a while from your ordinary judgments and develop a good foundation inside so that your judgments can be more reliable. When you admit the, the existence of things you don't like, and you can see why they're there, where they come from. If you try to deny them or run away from them, you're never going to understand them. So the first step is to develop the sort of resilience inside. Then when you've mastered that, then you go on to the next step where you start using your powers of judgment again. 
but this time in line with the Four Noble Truths. Otherwise you do what you can to develop the path. The Buddha's description of how you get the mind into right concentration is his definition of right mindfulness. You keep track of the body in and of itself. For example, the breath right now. Where is the breath right now? How does it feel? Is it long? Is it short? And does long breathing feel good or does short breathing feel better? How about deeper, shallow, heavier, light? Fast or slow? Experiment. Learn how to get a sense of what kind of breathing feels best right now. You're exercising your powers of judgment on something very simple. Because you're going to need them to pass judgment on what's going on in your mind. And that's a lot more subtle. And the Buddha recommends that you breathe in and out, sensitive to the whole body. You can build up to that section by section first. You go through the body, starting at the navel, going up the solar plexus, the middle of the chest, base of the throat, the middle of the head, then down the shoulders and the arms, down the back, down the legs, out to the tips of the toes. And then try to put it all together and allow the breath to go calm. Before you calm it down, though, allow it to be energizing. This is one of the reasons why John Lee recommends that you start with long breathing and then let it calm down. Otherwise, you put yourself to sleep. That's all called keeping aware of the body in and of itself. And then you put aside all of the thoughts related to the world. That's an act of judgment right there. And for the time being, the most skillful thing is to put thoughts of the world aside and to focus on settling in with your breath. And use three qualities to do this. Mindfulness, the ability to keep something in mind. Alertness, your ability to watch what you're doing and see what results you're getting. And ardency, the desire to do this well. Here again, desire. There are some desires that are good. Part of right effort is desire. So again, you're learning how to pass judgment. Which kind of desires are simply the craving that causes suffering, and which kind of desires are part of the path that takes you away? And as you keep your attention focused on the breath, eventually you settle down get into a good state of concentration. And then you learn how to maintain that. Again, you're passing judgment. Other thoughts come up, and they can come up screaming in your ears, saying, you've got to think about me, you've got to be responsible for this thing outside, that thing outside. And you have to say no. Right now the most important thing is getting the mind into a state of concentration so that it can see itself. And things are going to come up and pull you away. And you have to be able to analyze them. Sometimes you can just say no to them and they disappear. Other times they keep coming back, coming back. In a case like that, the Buddha says you've got to learn how to see their drawbacks. And you balance that with trying to say, well, what's the allure to begin with? Why do you go for these things? What's the attraction that keeps them coming back? Sometimes it's because they're entertaining. Sometimes you feel that you have a, an obligation to think certain thoughts, to be concerned about certain issues. And you have to learn how to see through that. 
you keep reminding yourself, your main responsibility, both to yourself and the people around you, is to get your mind under control and to do it in a way that it stays under control. That means you have to do it in a way that the mind actually likes being under control. So you work with the breath, so it's comfortable. You work with the breath, so it's refreshing. You do what you can to gladden the mind so it's happy to be here. So you look at the allure of those thoughts and try to compare it with what you're trying to do with the concentration. You see that those thoughts have their drawbacks. They get in the way of doing something that's more important. I'm going to find the hitch here that, yeah, you're really worse off following those thoughts than you would be by not following them. When you really understand that point, then there's a sense of dispassion. Dispassion is not the gray, lifeless attitude that some people think it is. It's more like growing up. Games you used to, used to like to play when you were a child, you look back at them and say, I don't need to play those games anymore. They hold, hold no more interest. Or like the sweets you like, used to like to eat as a child. As you get older, you realize that they're very not, very much not good for you. And John Suwa tells the story of when he was a young monk, staying with a John Mun. And every now and then a John Mun would complain that something that he was eating was way too sweet. And John Suwa thought to himself, how can anything be too sweet? And then as he got older, he realized well, there is such a thing. And that's dispassion. You grow up. And it's through dispassion that you gain an escape. You've passed judgment that those things are not worth the drawbacks. So you're getting exercise in learning how to use your powers of judgment. For all that we hear that as we're meditating, we're trying to get a non-judging mind. We're not passing value judgments on anything. That applies only to that first step, what the Buddha calls householder equanimity, when you simply force yourself to be equanimous. You know, at later stages in the path, there will come higher levels of equanimity, but they come from having satisfied your, your desire for pleasure inside, well-being inside. There's the equanimity that comes with the right concentration, but that comes only after periods of rapture, periods of pleasure. In other words, the mind gets fed, and then its equanimity is that of someone who's well-fed. You know, look at more food and you decide, I've had enough. It doesn't appeal to you doesn't repel you, but it's just it's there. Or the equanimity that comes with insight, when you see that you're able to free yourself from being a slave to certain defilements. There's a sense of contentment that comes with that, but there, it follows on joy. And of course, then there's the equanimity that comes after gaining awakening. Awakening is not in and of itself the highest equanimity. Awakening is the highest happiness. But then there's an equanimity that also results from having found that happiness. So that's the kind of equanimity the Buddha is basically recommending as the path progresses. That's all based on learning how to use your powers of judgment, exercise your powers of judgment in a new way, before you judge the things that you crave, the things you clung to. It's really worth craving, really worth clinging to. Faulty powers of judgment. So you step back, learn how to be more non-reactive, and then you learn how to train your powers of judgment in line with the Buddhist standards. So we're not getting training in not judging. We're training, getting training in how to be more skillful in how we judge. 
as we decide what's worth doing, what's not worth doing, what's worth developing, worth, what's worth abandoning. So learn to become a connoisseur of your breath as a beginning stage in retraining your powers of judgment. This ability to commit yourself to the practice and then reflect on the results is the process by which your powers of judgment get developed in a way they really are conducive to genuine happiness.